the only reason to give a speech is to change the world. These are the intimidating words of the American president, John F. Kennedy. And fortunately, our goal is somewhat more modest, yet still daunting. We tackle the greatest obstacle to innovation, resistance to change. This is a challenge for all of us throughout our lives. And while it is challenging and daunting, change is always disruptive. It's just more disruptive for some than for others. Now, I guess I need to be honest. Winston Churchill never really said that. But what I find is that when I attribute things to Sir Winston Churchill, they have far greater credibility. So, <laughs> so, so, so innovation is more than just coming up with new ideas. This is creativity, and you get no credit for brilliant ideas unless you can implement them. An idea is not an innovation until it is implemented and adds value. Innovation is knowing how to extract value from creativity. As Winston Churchill reminds us, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. He actually said that. I should be. <laughs> uh, so here's the axiom of, well, here's the formula for innovation. Our formula is innovation equal ideas plus implementation plus benefits realization. And those are supported by passion and trust. Innovation does not happen without passion and without trust. These are not the goals, but they are the engines. Passion fuels performance. And if the resistance is equal to or greater than any of these three, innovation will not occur. So why are we having this conversation now? We're having this conversation now because 91% of human resource directors in the United Kingdom and in Ireland say that by 2018, just three short years from now, people will be hired based on their ability to manage change and uncertainty. So how do we ignite innovation? How do you move from a type S static organization to a type a agile organization. How do you move your colleagues from change resistors to change insisters? Our framework will be an axiom of persuasion. Never, never a statistic without a story and never a story without a statistic. So here are three data points. 60%, 70%, 49.3%. 60% is the percentage of chief executives who say that innovation is the primary focus of their organization. 70% is the percentage of those same innovations that fail. And 49.3, that's the win rate rolling the dice in Las Vegas. Right? You have a better chance of winning in Las Vegas than if your innovation succeeding. And you just cannot afford to continue gambling with your innovations. Employee resistance is the most common reason cited by executives for failure of innovations. And failure to establish sufficient readiness for change accounts for half of all failures. Now keep in mind, keep in mind, you can never ever forcefully change someone. They need to change themselves. And you need to get inside the resistor's head to help them. 
So now the story. First, there was the show Cracker, in which the psychologist Fitz tried to get into the mind of the person that the Manchester police was looking for. And then in the States, we came along with a very, very popular television show, Criminal Minds. Now, offender profiling is designed to help investigators predict the characteristics of the unsub, that is the unknown, the unidentified subject. And it's in that spirit that we present changing minds, the profile of a change resistor. So what is the profile of these serial saboteurs, those who would get between you and successfully implementing your next innovation, those who might kill your next change initiative? Well, based on our research and years of field work, here is what we know so far about the change resistor. And we'll just spotlight seven areas. In terms of their country of birth, our unsub is likely from the small Western European country of Luxembourg, where, and I kid you not, the official national motto is, we want to remain what we are. Half a million people born and bred to be, K, to be resistors. Their current residents, well, this is very, very clear. Our resistors are cave dwellers. That is C-A-V-E. They are constantly against virtually everything, right? right? It doesn't matter what it is. If you want to make enemies, just try changing anything. Again, it just doesn't matter. You suggest the change. They tell you all the reasons this is not a good idea. Here, here. Maybe a great idea elsewhere, just not here. We call this the NIH syndrome. Not invented here. Um, and while the mantra of most companies is change or die, for our change resistors, it is often is, we'd rather die than change, <laughs> right? This is the status quo trap where maintaining the current situation involves the least psychological risk because caves, like silos, are perceived as safe, secure, and insulated. However, with some innovations, it's reasonable to ask, why would someone help facilitate the change in your organization when his or her livelihood, his or her job security, his or her job satisfaction depends on maintaining the status quo? Faster, cheaper, better, that may mean they no longer need me. In terms of their favorite subject in high school, our unsubs, our change resistors, are huge fans of biology. Clearly their favorite subject. And in particular, homeostasis. Homeostasis is the biological process of keeping everything constant. Now, here we have a serious one. In terms of their phobias, our unsubs suffer from the clinical diagnosis of metathesiophobia. Metathesiophobia, these are people who often feel that they have no control over their lives due to constant change. Now, this is a natural tendency amongst human beings. It's an evolutionary tendency of a survival instinct. We feel, the metathesiophobe feels, that the, they lose control, and only with the phobic, the fear is irrational, it's intensive, and it's constant. We're actually looking for two types of metathesiophobes. Those who suffer from microphobia. Microphobia is a fear of small things, typically germs and insects, and in the case of our change resistors, small initiatives, incremental innovation. 
And the second phobia is megalophobia, typically fear of large things, large buildings, large animals, and in our case, quantum change. So, you know, it was two and a half centuries ago that the Buddha spoke of but three types of suffering. And one of those three types was the suffering of change. And the Buddha said that all suffering of change was due to but one thing, fear. And he said something that has always struck me and I've always found to be the case with change resistors. The fear exists even when the change is perceived as change for the good. Fear is the strongest emotion of change resistors, and it typically, in my work, falls into one of three buckets. Time, trouble, or treasure. And so while most of us don't suffer from the clinical diagnosis of metathesiophobia, when people are asked, about the pace of change, the majority of us globally, globally say that the pace of change in our organizations are too fast, are too fast. So, um, based on our profiling so far, how many of you believe that at least one third, one third of the people in your organization are comprised of cave people? or those who suffer from an occasional bout of metathesiophobia, or those who suffer from the NIH syndrome, or fall into the status quo trap. How many of you? Very, very interesting. Uh, to bring this closer to home, um, try taking some of those morning rituals that we all have and just switch up the sequence. Try combing your hair before brushing your teeth or vice versa, right? At times, we're all change resistors. And while there's no very good data on the percentage of the workforce that are change resistors, if we extrapolate from the data that we do have, and we saw just now, we come up with about 67%. About two-thirds of the workforce are change resistors. Of course, about 68% of all statistics are made up on the spot, but uh, <laughs> um, our experience tells us that we overestimate, overestimate our power to change others and underestimate the need to change ourselves. You know, if someone was diagnosed with cancer, knowing the type of cancer would profoundly, profoundly inform everything, everything from that point forward. We developed a typology for launching and leading and realizing benefits from change initiatives that moves along a continuum from evolutionary change, kind of, if you will, mini-ovations, to revolutionary. And understanding that innovations come in a variety of shapes and sizes and intensity must inform all that follows. In terms of their health status in our profiling, apart from the phobia, our unsubs are likely healthy, pain-free, and actually feeling really, really good when people and organizations are not experiencing pain, inertia sets in. I mean, why change? Why change? Ah, their favorite book. Upon hearing of a pending change, there's a clear pattern that our resistors follow. The first is denial. I can't believe this is happening. You must have heard wrong. It must just be a rumor to anger. I can't believe this is happening. How could they possibly do this to us? To bargaining. Well, maybe if we agree to this, they won't make the change with that. To depression. To depression. 
In Kubler-Ross's book on death and dying, she talks about five stages of grief. Five stages. But I've given you only four. What's the fifth stage? The fifth stage is acceptance. And this is where our change resistors diverge from the dying. Change resistors often never reach the acceptance stage. Uh, from my perspective, there's only one cohort, only one group that I've ever experienced that thinks change is good. And this is a baby with a wet diaper, or, 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 or should I say nappy, right? Um, uh, it's the only one that I've ever seen that thinks change is good. Uh, what we say, if you're going to make a change, it had better make a difference. Let's be very, very clear. There's nothing particularly good about change. Change is simply making something different. Positive change is making something better. Our objective is for positive change. What do we have next? It is often not the change that people resist. It's how organizations handle it. And I think it's a really, really important concept. Most of us handle change really, really poor, difficult in our organizations. In fact, if I worked in one of your organizations, and I'm terrible in finance, I could go to your finance department and they'd help me. If I worked in one of your organizations and I'm equally terrible in technology, I could go to your IT people and they'd help me. But if I worked in one of your organizations and I was asked to work on a change initiative, an innovation, because I had some technical skill, but I know nothing about that, who would I see about that? That is, who do you have that's in charge of change and innovation? It's a really interesting question because arguably there are only two things organizations do. Innovation, coming up with new stuff, and operations, which is sustaining that stuff downstream. And all the people who do the work in this area, we all agree that the real opportunity for growth, for competitive advantage, uh, for making a difference is in the innovation. Okay. Trust is really the key characteristic of innovative co companies. The data shows this very clearly. And why is this so? Because all innovation involves a four-letter word, risk. And trust is necessary to increase our tolerance for uncertainty. That is, it's enabling. It allows people to take risk when the outcome is unpredictable. And risk is not just a bad thing. Risk is a good thing and a bad thing. And a bad thing. Good risk is opportunity. And bad risk is threat. Our unsubs, unfortunately, are risk adverse. And they really don't see the split personality of risk. This is the conflict that we've talked about between perception and reality. My final word is, let's not simply admire the problem. Good luck. Okay, <laughs>